Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Ref6 Weekly podcast. Uh, I'm joined by uh, John, my co-host. Hello. And uh, we've got Lee Waters uh, on the line, who has done some fascinating research around referees and eyes, eye tracking, uh, and a load of different stuff around that. So, Lee, before we go delve into it, can you just give you a, give an intro about you? Because I couldn't do couldn't do it justice. So, if you can just introduce yourself and and maybe just the topic of your research. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me on. Um, it, yeah, my, so my name's Lee Waters. I am a sports lecturer, a senior lecturer that I've been for uh, about 10 years now, uh, working within the higher education sector, specialising more into performance and sports, uh, sports psychology. Um, I am a performance psychologist on the side, so typically looking uh, mainly at footballers uh, with, with regards to, to coaching and trying to make sports psychology as applied as I possibly can. Uh, rather than having to get them sat into a classroom, which is traditionally how a lot of um, sports psychology is delivered. Um, and then also, I'm a, if I'm not busy enough, I'm also a PhD student. So I'm moving into my fourth year of my PhD. So hopefully only about 18 months to go because I'm doing it part time. I'm focusing on the underlying mechanisms of decision making, specifically looking at gaze behavior and search, search strategies. Uh, which is something we're going to discuss uh, throughout this conversation. I look forward to it. No, brilliant. Thanks. Thanks for joining. And um, I, I'm <clears> fascinated. And I, I, I'm everyone who listens to to this podcast knows that I can talk for hours. But I'm hoping that Lee, you're gonna you're gonna do a lot of talking. I, I think the first thing to start on is you mentioned you predominantly work with fo- footballers and apply applying the sports psychology not in in classroom but in kind of you mentioned apply setting. Talk, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm obviously going to come at it from, from my so-called specialist area in terms of decision making, trying to enhance that um, as much as I possibly can from real life settings. Footballers want to know how is that going to improve their game? And if you get them talking about it just simply in a classroom, and that's your only delivery mechanism, uh, they won't necessarily make the connection between what's being discussed in the classroom to what, how they can then use it out on the on the field, on the pitch. Um, so I can talk to them endlessly about theories. I can talk to them endlessly about, endlessly about processes and things like that. But actually, if they're not doing it, if they're not showing it, if they're not making improvements in the settings that they're being test, ultimately tested in, then the buy-in is probably not, not going to be as, uh, as strong. So I get them into a variety of different situations where they have to make decisions, um, whether that be uh, trying to get them to a point of fatigue, so physically fatigued, and then they'll have a random activity that they have to do from a cognitive basis. So they'll have to do some, uh, I don't know, they'll have to do some simple sums, they'll have to do some simple mathematics, Mm -hmm. um, or they'll have to uh, see pieces of information, recall that, and then retain that piece of information and then recall it a few minutes later, all based on them having to try and use the information that they that they have gained during that situation, but then ultimately to make a decision. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so yeah, try and get them is uh, in in game related as possible. That's super interesting. So, if we switch to referees, I've seen what you've just described. I've seen some of the elite referees. This happens with the elite referees. They'll they'll do a big fitness test, a bleep test, or something like that, or a few sprints, that, and then they'll get in front of a screen and watch an incident happen and have to make a decision. Right. So is that very similar to to kind of what what you do with the footballers? Yeah, it it is, but it's it's just it, it, rather than using a screen, actually getting them do it. Um, mm-hmm. So for for example rather than getting them watching a situation where they have to predict where the ball is going, they're mm-hmm. actually in the situation and have to do the yeah. passing of the ball or predict where it's going because they're actually realistically in that position. The, mm-hmm. the, it's, a, it's a great delivery mechanism to use in terms of getting them fatigued and looking at a TV screen. Um, but quite often it doesn't get, from my perspective, it doesn't get the true... Um, development because your your tracking is only situated between the the length of that screen or the or, or the or the size of that screen um so you don't get true depth perception you don't get true judgment of distances you don't go through the full motion of your of the what are called saccades so moving 
the eyes left and right and up and down. Um, so the more realistic the setting can be, the better. That's not discrediting what they're doing, by the way. That's just it's just if that's the if that's the only delivery mechanism, then there needs there should really be some 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 add-on to that. Yeah. No. No. Cool. Yeah. Um, so following that, how did you then get into sort of the match official stuff? So obviously you've started heavily on the player aspect. Like, what brought you to the sort of the referee side or match official side? Uh, I'm a good question. I'm a frustrate. I'm a frustrated footballer at heart. Um, I could. I was. I was. I was okay. I was. I was never going to make it. Make it. Uh, make it as a professional or anything like that. I was okay. I could hold my own. Um, but it always fascinated me and sometimes annoyed me. Being perfectly honest, some of the decisions that were made um, on a on a football pitch, um, which. And, and I went through a process by, from, a, from a personal perspective of, of trying to stop moaning about a situation if I'm not prepared to do anything about it. So it really took me to the point of, well, actually, all these people are moaning about referees. They've got, they've got a very, very hard job, a very, very hard job. I mean, some of the research that's, been, that's coming out now, of how many decisions have got to be made during a 90-minute perspective. I mean, the current number that's being bonded, banded around is 245 decisions per, per game. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's one decision every 22 seconds and, and that's and that's just that's just game related decisions that's not um th that's not anything to do with where they move personally as an individual or do, do they need to in, in, increase their pace or slow down or anything like that? that's not any of that that's just literally game related situations so i guess it got to the point where i was thinking well actually i can stop moaning about it i'm in a position to be able to do something about it it's a significant gap in the research. There's been some uh, there's been some work done in other sports, so in volleyball officiating and ice hockey officiating, but not really within within the world of football and soccer. Not from the applied setting that I'm looking at it from anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so really, me and my PhD uh, supervisors and team, we kind of we, we landed on it, and we're like, this is an area that is really really fascinating, and we could get some really interesting data. And also, ultimately, assist in in this in this process. And it's really, really important to, to kind of get across that in no way, in any way, shape, or form, through this, have I been trying to say uh, that referees are doing a bad job, hit them over the head with a stick. Oh my God! It's not in any way. I mean, the the accuracy of the decisions is really high, really, really high. Um, it's just trying to analyse what they do during a correct decision in comparison to what they do to an incorrect decision and then try and influence the, tra the, the training so then we can make those incorrect decisions start to start to reduce. Do you find that there's um, a change in what they look for in say for example an aerial challenge versus a ground challenge right is it a big difference or do you find they look very much at the same thing all the time? Well, my, the majority of my research actually orientates around offsides. So it's where it's where they're they're specifically looking um, during an offside decision. Um, so to be perfectly honest, I haven't really uh, looked that much into challenges um, and, and and things like that. It's kind of like been an, been a byproduct of of the setting that I have uh, been creating because um, obviously there's been it's a real setting which we'll go into in a in a bit. Um, but there's challenges being going on. So it's been interesting to see what people have been looking at. It's usually around the centre of mass. So typically around uh, the, the, the main, uh, the, the, the chest or, or the back, if the player is to, is to if this player's got their backs to them. Um, and then there's reasons for that. As, we, as, as I say, we'll go, we'll go a bit further into that. So, so Lee, do you want to just, do you want to go into it then? So in terms of the... Um, actual research what are you testing what what is how are you how are you testing it um yeah let's start there okay so um what we what kind of highlighted in it well identified within the research at the present moment in time there's a lot done in labs there's a lot done within uh, using tv screens there's a lot doing using laptops things like that um and they've brought about some really really interesting findings they brought about some really really interesting stuff which has influenced training as we as we kind of know it mm -hmm. um now like i already kind of said unfortunately with that you only get 
certain things about the process. You don't, you don't train as well as what you potentially could do because it's not real life. Um, so that really, really started to, to start to whet the appetite of how can we actually get this to be a real life setting with the technology that we've got. So I currently use eye tracker technology, which gives us the ability to pinpoint exactly where someone is looking at any given point. So when they're walking down the street, for example, we could literally see where they're looking, where their eyes are getting, where their eyes are gazing to, where um, they're interested in mainly, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a case of how can we deal with the, in some ways, the limitations of the technology, um, because the, the current technology, the current set of eye trackers that I'm using for my PhD, um, you have to wear a laptop on your back. Uh, so you have to wear, you look a little bit like a ghostbuster. In no way does it really um, kind of hinder your vision, in, really. Uh, but it does give you an extra kind of thing to think about that you wouldn't do in the real world, so to speak. It's really yeah. light. I've made it really light as possible. All it would be would be if anyone's ever, if anyone's ever done a longer run and they've had to wear some water on the back, so the Royal Camel Pack, no heavier than that. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't make that much difference but it is just a little thing that takes a couple of minutes to get used to so I've set up a situation where it's attack versus defense it's four defenders it's four attackers we're, uh, and, there's a, and there's a goalkeeper and the the idea is for the defenders to push up in a high line there's one um, and also to try and get the defenders to break this uh, to break this offside trap that has been that has been created in the hope that I can then see more offsides happening and mm -hmm. that's and that's what the, that's what's ultimately been trying to be trying to be done i focus on the offside decisions what are officials looking at what are they not looking at um, during correct and incorrect decisions um, and also as a byproduct once again it was trying to make sure that the team that i've been using the academy that i've been using have not been uh, just doing this for for the sake of it they've actually been getting some good coaching points from this as well. So how to move up as a back four, um, how to attack innovatively as a, as a, as a front four um, and things like that. Where does the goalkeeper come into this as well? So it's the greatest strength, as I was saying just before we, before we started recording, it's the greatest strength of this study that it's a real life situation. For me as a researcher, it's also its biggest downfall because there's so many moving parts to it trying to get officials and the team available on the same day, as well as the facilities, um, have, have been problematic, to, to, to say the least, um, but doable. I've, I'm already halfway through my data collection, so um, it's uh, for my entire PhD, so it, which is really, really good. That was a really long-winded answer, I'm sorry, but uh, that's, what <laughs> no, we, no. that's what we're doing. That's great. It, it kind of comes back to my point earlier about the elite officials that you mentioned the logistics about getting a team to a venue. You know, that's why sometimes the, the screen's the only option, right? Because getting a team and then making sure that they're playing, you know, we've, we've all set it up ourselves with fellow colleagues who are referees who really, we can't really play football, be honest, um, and trying to do an offside uh, attack versus defence and trying to simulate offside. It's just... Uh, crazy one so uh, it's um, interesting how you've managed to set up and you've obviously learned it's not, not the easiest thing to set up um so what so so with this eye tracker on you you're getting officials to to run the line and and, and look at the offsides already things in my head are coming into question right because all of a sudden you know the skill of the assistant referee is to know where that when the ball is going to be be played right and also where right because he's got he or she has got a judge the position of the, the the player who's passing the ball their body shape is it going to go down the right wing is it going to go down the middle is it going to go left and then look across all of these things so i'm hoping you you've seen a lot of that in the the data that you've been tracking and you know what are the main things you've seen first of all what is is it a lot of what i've just mentioned yeah it's it's interesting because um if I, if I just briefly uh, briefly mention from a from a f specific footballer's perspective, one of the most common things that you get taught is uh, from a, co a coach tells you, look at the ball, look at the ball, look at the ball. If you are defending, that is the most important piece of information that you are going to uh, take, and that informs your next decision. 
But actually, if you think about it logically, if you just look at the ball, the ball's already moved. It takes time for you to process the information that the ball has moved for you then to go through the process of then sending a signal to your working muscles to say, I need to move with it. Mm -hmm. That takes, that takes time. And by and more often than not, by the time the ball's moved, the player's already passed you and you can't really do much about it. And then that's ultimately something that creates a foul or, or something like that, or you in a bad position. So if you can take information quicker from a different source to try and predict, to try and anticipate where things are going, that is probably better than better than most. So actually, from a footballer's perspective, it's good to look at the good to look at the hips and the knees and the, and the uh, and the foot angle to see where that person is going. Because typically, if a person is puts their weight onto their left hand side, more often than not, that means that they're going to be pushing right. And more often than not, if they go to their right hand side, they're going to be pushing to their to their left. So you can kind of anticipate. Obviously, it's not always 100% accurate, but you can start to use information. And the reason I mentioned that is because that's the interesting thing is, is that's something that's been similarly, it's similarly seen with the officials. Because mm -hmm. from the attacking sense, they're actually looking at the angle of the, player, of the player. So the player that's on the ball, they're actually, see, they're actually looking at the angle that they're facing. How is their body shaping up? what is the likelihood of the ball going to a certain area? And because of that, they're able to then predict, anticipate which area not to really pay as much attention to and then focus on a specific area. Um, so yeah, from an attack, from, from the official's perspective, when they're looking at the attacker, yes, they look at the body angles. Um, from a general sense, the, the most common because I'm looking at search patterns and um, what people look at the most. Mm -hmm. The most common place to, for, a, for an official to be successful in the decisions, what I found in my research is, is the last defender. So the, the, main, the center of mass is the last defender. Um, and then they, they keep flipping back to that last defender. And that's what we call um, something called a gaze anchor. Um, so it's something that um, they, they keep going back to. So it doesn't mean that they can't move from it. It just means that that is where they go back to. So they will go from the defender to the attacker to see where the ball is, go back to the defender, go back to the furthest, the furthest attacker forward, and then they'll go back to, back to the defender. That's typically the most common um, successful search pattern that has, has been seen through the, the research that I've done so far. Um, there has been other ones. So there have been ones where uh, people have actually fixated on a, a, a point in a pitch. So some fixated, some have fixated on a, uh, on a line, on, on the 18-yard box, for example, depending on how far down the line they are. Mm -hmm. So they've decided that they're going to use the line as the most important point. And then they start to go through the pieces of information. The point is, is that, the official needs to find a point where they can see the most important information. Mm -hmm. what, what do they need? They need where, where the defender's positioning is, the furthest attacker, and also when the ball is played. Can they see those three pieces of information um, very, very quickly? Um, because if they can't, then obviously then that becomes an inefficient search strategy. And did you, of those two strategies that you mentioned around line versus the last defender and flipping back was either one more successful yeah definitely the, the one the one that was used the defender as the most yeah. uh, is, is the is the anchor um and then flipping between the uh, the attacker um where the ball is etc that was definitely the most successful um because others others started using not the lines they actually may have in, even used points in um in the sky so they looked a bit higher um, okay. in the, which was which was interesting and to, and to be perfectly honest I thought that was something to do with the calibration of, of the eye tracker which is a big thing um, mm -hmm. but actually part of my research has been having an open dialogue and a reflective piece with this and they were actually saying no no no, no that, that's, not, that's not an issue that, that's what I do I look, I look a few feet above, above players 
So then I can see for, from their point of view, I can see from a kind of like a bird's eye view, that's where their head goes, which was an that's, interesting, interesting one. That, that's super interesting. Did you have any correlation between, I, my assumption is that when, when you got the officials to do this testing, that you asked them how many times they've run a line before, right? Did, mm -hmm. did, did that have an, an implication in, in any of your results? So for example, was, was the people who were looking at a line or looking in the distance uh, more more junior in their their experience or yeah go for it yeah so so there was so some to be perfectly honest when I asked when I asked all of the officials so in my research I've got twenty officials that's that's studies one and two so there's twenty taking part in this um, and if they listen to this I thank you very much for that because it took your time out that's, it's absolutely fantastic they took part in it um, with it it started to come out that if they were more experienced, um, there was more definitive movements of what they were doing. So the, the strategy that I've just specifically said about defender, mm -hmm. ball, a player on the ball, back to a defender, that, that was common within the more experienced, the ones that have had 50 plus games um, within, their, within their experience. Um, the ones that weren't as experienced tended to be quite all over the place. Although those mm -hmm. strategies existed, you could pick it out. It wasn't their main, their main thing that they that they did. It would they would look everywhere. They would look at all kinds of pieces of information. They would look at all of the defenders as much as they could. They could would look at all of the defenders as much as they could, um, which was which was quite interesting. So, as someone gets more and more experienced, it does it does appear that you become more structured in your approach, in your search strategy, um, and you start to be able to differentiate between what's relevant information and what's irrelevant information. Um, and that was borne out from the interviews as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm just trying to, it's been a long time since we've been on a pit, so I'm just trying to make sure I'm, I, 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 did the speed have anything to do with it of that back and forth? Because I, I would probably I, I'm I'm convinced I do the, the the latter, the more experienced one, where I'm going back and forth between the back, last defender and the attacker. And I wonder if uh, I I wonder if like the speed of going between back and forth has an impact too um, on decision making. Because is it is it the do you need to be going back and forth so quickly? Does that have an impact? Like again, what what did your study show? Your well, but yeah, it's it, once again, it's, it's almost as if you've uh, you've read some of this research because these are all, <laughs> these are all great questions. Um, so when you are less experienced, it has been shown in, in multiple studies, not just um, not not just the stuff that I've been doing. Um, but if you are less experienced, you typically are you you start to bound around left, right, and centre. You're thinking about all these kind of things. You're looking at this, you're looking at that, you're like kind of like a magpie, really. Go, oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and then the speed is much, much quicker. So you actually, when you're less experienced, you are flipping between everything quick and really, really quickly. As you become more experienced, you become more purposeful in what you do. You become more structured. You become more... Um, at, you, you don't have to look at other things because you've already gained the information from from the thing that you were with, with, that you were looking at. So you mm -hmm. can spend more time looking at that one thing because you know you don't have to go to that other thing because it doesn't make sense at this present moment in time. Mm -hmm. I don't need to pay attention to the grass. I don't need to pay attention to the goalkeeper because he's he's a non-entity or she's a non-entity at this point. Um, I don't need to do that, so I can just focus on the defender straight to the ball straight to where the attacker is, straight back to the defender. And that becomes more purposeful. And I'm talking, I'm talking like we're, 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 talking, we're talking seconds here. We're not, we're talking, we're talking hundreds of seconds here. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, that is something that is happening all of the time. I mean, you only have to think about how many times you've moved your eyes in the last 20 minutes since we've been talking and that's I'm, I'm feeling very conscious right now about <laughs> my eyes. it's really strange um, yeah I've, I've got a couple more questions I know John's got a few but I've got a couple that I wanted to get off my chest otherwise I'll forget them and I've, <laughs> I've, I've actually got a point interestingly so you mentioned that uh, every 22 seconds um, a decision's made in in the game 
Um, I will be remiss. Mark Burkett, who's one of our leading futsal referees, always told me that in futsal, it's one in nine, one in one decision every nine seconds. It's a lot quicker. So I, I just want to get that in there. Just that it's a, <laughs> another useless fact, but it's interesting. So my two questions, um, the first one's around. So again, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm visualizing as you're talking about this, I'm visualizing. And a lot of the time, actually, you're not looking at the ball as the assistant. You're looking between the back at the last, uh, and you're, you're hearing, you're waiting to hear from the, the, the ball. Again, <laughs> what, did your research show that that technique was better or worse? And were you even accounting for that, that at all? But was, was listening to it um, a, a good technique to use? Or do you need to glance over to the ball to make a, a better decision? Yeah, it's it, the the eye track has the ability to have audio as well. Um, so one of the things that was uh, that that we did did incorporate that I incorporated in it was when a decision was made, either to say it was offside or um, or not, was that they had to rate, rate between one and ten as to how confident they were as to whether that was the right decision or not. And then we when we went through the reflective part of of the study. That was what we discussed. So why would, did you give that an eight? Why did you give that a four? That kind of thing. And it was interesting because some, some of the, the officials said that they were caught in between their, their thing, their, their strategy that they were going through. And mm. they, they heard the ball. And then they were in some ways trying to predict what they saw last. And we're only, once again, we're only talking point. 1.2, 0.3 of a second. We're talking split seconds here, um, and they, and some of them had to had to predict it from this from the the officials that I used. There was only one official that used that as a as a definitive strategy. They would use the sound of the ball being kicked as to when they they would judge that. So I don't have enough data to say that that was sure. successful or unsuccessful. The um, the. It's, it's super interesting. You, you mentioned like in between the strategy when I, I can, I can almost feel that happening where you've got this process and really when, when the ball gets kicked, at least in my opinion, my gaze, I want to be on that last defender. Mm. Um, and if I'm, if I've, if I'm caught and I've lost my, I'm, I'm on the attacker as the ball's played, it's not the best information that I've, I can take in. So it's really interesting you say that. I'll keep my next question. I'll let John go go ahead because I feel like his are probably going to be more pertinent to this now. Um, go for it. Yeah, so you said you did 20 um, officials, but you were saying the difference between almost a rookie and an experience. Like what do you define that gap as like between becoming experienced and not being so ex experienced? Yeah, so with, with the research that uh, the participants that took part, um, I didn't realise when we decided to focus on officials that it was going to be so hard to get access to the higher end officials. I don't, mm -hmm. genuinely didn't realise it was going to be um, as much of a problem as it was. Um, so actually, we had to reframe where the PhD went, so or the, the, the thesis went. So Initially, it was kind of based around a com um, comparing elite officials to, to novices. Actually, I couldn't, I, I can't definitively say that I had any elite officials within, um, w w within the research because we had um, a, a couple of level three up to, and, but the, the majority aimed, aimed around level four, level five and six, and I had a few level seven. Um, mixed in with that was how many, games they had actually that they'd actually officiated um and also how many they'd actually run the line because some of them had only uh, so some of them had predominantly run the line and then a couple of them in the past year or so two years had mainly focused on being the man in the middle so they had potentially um, not had as much experience recently of, of running the line um, so there was a right there was there was a mixed bag between typically between level three and level seven, um, and to compare to compare the the differences between between them, um, but then if the the level didn't really um, differentiate anything, then it was it's, we started to look at the, at the amount of games and as I say, fifty typically started it seemed to be um, a common number for things to become a little bit more structured after fifty. 
not quite sure what yet, um, but it's something to investigate further. Um, something seems to click and something seems to be a little bit more structured after that, roughly that 50 point. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Um, do you find that distance from the, oh, like the decision makes a massive difference? Because like, from gut feel, I think it's, for me, it's harder to judge an offside if it's right in front of my face. Because obviously I don't, there's two things to look at there. And if there's anyone behind the mat, so do you find that like the distance of the decision makes a big difference? Yeah. So once again, it's almost as if I've given you my research before. <laughs> you, you, you're, you're asking all these questions and it, it's great, fellas. Um, so one of one of the things that was highlighted as because we, we um, I did something uh, qualitative analysis, so we did lots of interviews and doing it. What's and I drew up what's called a thematic map. And it kind of highlighted some really, really important um, themes from the officials to say what is most important when making an offside decision. And one of them was the distance. So one of them was the distance, whether that be close to them or the furthest away. The ones in the middle, they generally were, were quite comfortable with. Um, the ones closest to them typically orientated around something called, um, you may be aware of the phrase, the flash lag effect. So mm -hmm. when the, um, the attacker's running uh, in one direction, the defender's running in the other, um, one's trying to push up, one's trying to break, break through, and then they cross over, or where did, that, where did they cross over kind of thing. Um, and that typically orientated around, uh, around that. So, yes, absolutely. We found the distance was one of the factors that played a part in whether it was, um, whether they found they were confident in the offside decision or not. There's speed coming to that as well. So I don't know how you ran, obviously you ran the experiment, but like, obviously like if a referee is crabbing, he's got more of a sort of wider gaze, but if he's having to dart along the line, He's turning his head a lot more. Did, did you run it like that, or how did you sort of set it up in that way? It was literally, uh, literally half a football pitch. Um, they were they were on the left back, so it was just to make sure that um, it was consistent all the time. They were always on the left back, um, and they yeah, so they they ran the line as if they would would in a normal game. So the 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 the, the start of the drill, so called drill would start just be, be in, uh, behind the, uh, the halfway line. And then there'd be a passage of play all the way through. So the defenders were seeing everything. The, the official was seeing everything. So literally they had the entire line from the halfway line to, uh, to the corner flag um, to, run, uh, to run that line. So it was exactly how they would do it, not in a normal game. Yeah, no, that, that's cool. Um, and I'm glad you said left backs because I couldn't think of anything worse than to try and do an experiment right backs. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, I think my eyes, where my eyes would be, would be the least of my worries. It would be <laughs> that would be a really interesting. Uh, it wouldn't be a PhD, but just a small little test is mm. to get the experienced officials to na then run right back and just see mm. how detrimental it is because basically, traditionally, referees run left back. Backs, right that's uh, assistant referees run left backs there are some referees out there that l like their assistants to run right backs yeah. or i've even had some who like their assistants to run left back first half and right back second half which is blows my mind but i've always thought that i've only run right backs a few times but it's basically like starting again so that yeah. would be another interesting experiment just to see how detrimental it is to change a position and yeah, try and do it the other side. To, to be honest, it's not something I've even considered, but I'm, now I'm thinking about it. Yeah, that's that's, re that's actually really interesting because yeah. in, in a in a former life, I used to be a I used to be an athlete. I used to run, um, used to do 400 meters, mm -hmm. and for some to make sure, because obviously when you're running around a bend all of the time, you you use your left leg in a certain way. So to try and balance it up, my coach used to get me to run the opposite way around the bend. So I was using my right leg in a certain way. Um, it did feel like I was having to learn how to how to run again because it was different running mechanics. And yeah, I, I, I've not thought of it from that perspective, but yeah, that that would be quite interesting to see. You've just blown my mind. I, I, every fitness test I've, I've ever done as a referee, we always go around the same yeah. the same it's direction. Is that a left hand turn? Is that like the the norm? Is it okay? So yeah, yeah so let, turn it around. It's just like it just blows your mind, right? Like all of a sudden, everything's just. 
<laughs> you're in a different parallel universe. Um, it's a shame. It's a shame you haven't got been able to get elite officials. But um, uh, yeah, I think that would be a really interesting uh, thing to observe. Like, is there a? You're obviously seeing this kind of uh, this 50 games being like a key a key um, kind of tipping point almost for experience. But I wonder if the elite officials, there's another tipping point mm. at another end. That would be interesting. Could this be used as a t- test in some way to determine? I'm not saying it should be the only test that an assistant referee should do, but could it be a good test to determine? Um, like, imagine if you didn't, you haven't already asked refer- uh, the assistant referees how many games they've done. If you had five of them, and you did this test, do you think you could um, almost go backwards and say, well, I think you've never run a, run a line before and you've run 75 plus games. Do you think that the data is there to figure that out and almost test to see how good they are just based on where they're looking? Yes. In a simple word, yes. Yeah. Um, because in my my third study is, uh, is geared towards comparing the, the officials that I've already tested um, so the qualified, the experienced, in comparison to to novices who who are actually footballers, um, and some of the footballers have not been uh, as happy because they they think that they know how to run a line, they think that um, they make the right decisions and things like that. But actually, um, it, it was inevitable that the, their decisions weren't going to be as accurate. And I, although I haven't finished the analysis of that study because. Good old COVID got in the way of that um, because we weren't, as, weren't able to um, complete the testing as of yet. Um, at the moment, the the football uh, aren't as accurate as uh, as the qualified uh, qualified officials. But in answer to your question, yes, absolutely, you'll be able to. Um, you, you should be able to see um, the difference between an experienced and inexperienced official, because just simply because of the, just simply because of the speed. How, how long they, they, they decide to stay on something and, and then obviously the accuracy of the decision. Interesting. So um, for, for the listeners out there that uh, uh, we, we have novice referees all the way up to elite level who listen, um, what are the things from your studies that they can, what are the practical things that they can take out of it that they can go out and, you know, potentially train or do um, you know what? What are those things? Mm. Yeah. So, so one one thing is uh, with this, there was a. I'm very very conscious of that there was there was a movement back with uh, with GB Athletics back in the day where they thought that they needed to change everybody's running mechanics and they needed to um, think about uh, altering everyone's sprinting technique and things like that. Unfortunately, what happened with that? There was a massive massive upsurge. Of, of injuries, of hamstring injuries, of lower back injuries and things like that. Um, and the reason I mention that is because in no way am I now suggesting that everyone now should definitively, right, go to the defender, go to the ball, go to the attacker, all that kind of stuff. Because that potentially would mean upending a lot of people's ability to be able to do this. Some of this stuff is actually quite subconscious. And until they, they get hooked up to an eye tracker, they don't actually realise that they do a certain strategy. I'm not. I'm not sure if you fellas, when you when you do something, you're aware, you're consciously thinking, right? I need to look here. I need to look there. I need to look there. You just kind of, in some ways, naturally do it because it becomes mm-hmm. kind of second nature to you. So I don't want to. Don't want anyone to think that I'm just going to stand here or sit here at the pre- this present moment time and uh, mm-hmm. and preach to you um, that you should be doing that. That's what's been found to be the most successful strategy during this uh, during this study Mm -hmm. um but the key thing is that's from the quantitative data from the quality so the numbers the um the 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 kind of uh the the definitive um percentages and things like that from the qualitative part from the interviews from the discussions what has come out is that um what people find comfortable for themselves And this can be used as a kind of a reflective tool as to, because we can sit down, you can see what you have done. There's a crosshair of literally where you're looking at a certain point. You analyze, you can verbalize what you're doing, why you're doing that at a certain point. So it can become quite an effective um, reflective tool to use to try and help people. 
Um, so, so with that, you come up with your own certain strategies in some ways as to what you're most accurate with. What is starting to come out though from this is the importance of, um, of eyesight and the difference between eyesight and vision. Um, so something called binocular vision. So if someone is using their, their right eye or their left eye more dominantly, actually is potentially starting to become a factor. Um, because as someone becomes more and more fatigued, the brain can't correct that, uh, that dominance and your, your depth perception, et cetera, becomes a little bit less accurate. So you're, as you, the, the game kind of goes on, when you start to get to that magic 75, 80th minutes, all of a sudden your, your perception of things may not be as key, oh, sorry, as, cl as clued up as what it potentially was in, earlier in the game. Um, so training to make sure that we are as binocular as possible, i.e. using both eyes at the same time, um, is, is something that's, that's, that's really important. Um, to, to try and improve that. So I guess I guess those three things. One, I'm not I'm not trying to preach to say that everyone um, should use this strategy. It's mm -hmm. a successful strategy from the research that I've found from the quantitative data, but from the qualitative stuff, it's what people find most comfortable. But that there's a process that you have to go through in order to find that. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is the importance between eyesight and vision. Um, I've, I've said on social media multiple times that upwards of, depending on the research, upwards of 90% of the information we gain comes from our eyes. Yet when I ask the question, how much eye training do people do? I haven't had many people come back to me to say, oh yeah, by the way, I do some, I do some specific eye training. Um, but how much, how much time do you dedicate to speed training, for example, or, or endurance training? Mm -hmm. um, it's quite, yeah, it's quite, it's quite interesting. So Lee, the, the easy follow-up question to that is how can people train their eyes? What, what, what does eye training look like? Yeah, and, and think, I think some, some people think, oh, no, this is just for the opticians. And I go, mm -hmm. to, I go to Specsavers and things like this, and um, they, they look after my eyes. Well, actually, we can look after our own eyes, and we can do it in certain ways. Something as simple, you can test, you can test whether you've got binocular vision very, very quickly, very, very simply, um, by putting your your hands um, into a triangle. Um, so just it's so just like this. Um, yeah. And then you can put them out stretched. So your hands out, hands out stretched. Um, yeah. pick, a tar pick a target on the board, uh, on, on the wall, ideally about 10, 10 foot away, ideally, something like that. So it mm -hmm. could be a clock, it could be a, um, a, a, a kind of a, a light switch or something like that. Yeah. Close your right eye. Yeah. And then does the does the target move or does it does it stay the same? Does it stay in in dead center? Um, and then open your right eye, and then close your left, and then see whether it moves at all. If it doesn't move, if it doesn't move in any shape or form, then congratulations, your binocular you've got binocular vision. Happy days. Um, if it moves when you close your right eye, um, typically that means that your right eye dominant. If it if it moves when your left eye um, is closed then typically that means your left eye dominant for me whenever i put my my target in my triangle i close my right eye and the entire thing disappears i'm i'm very i'm very right eye dominant um and that's something to for me you've just I'm blown my to... mind i am uh, <laughs> i am um, so it moves when i close my left eye yeah so if you, that typically means that you're left eye dominant yeah i'm the other way around yeah, because uh, as so, you're so, talking about this, I, I do think when I'm running the line, I do almost, I'm almost positive that I, I feel myself looking out of one eye more than. Do you get that, John? Or no, no. Okay, maybe, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe that is me. But I do, I do, I, I do get conscious of the fact that maybe I'm. That's interesting. Wow. Yeah. So that, so that's so that's one quick way of just testing it. Yeah. Um, to try and to try and get it a very very simple way to to try and get it back to being binocular would be to to have a, in a football setting it's good to have a ball so you have a ball out in front of you hold the ball um, focus on the center focus on the center of the ball and then bring it from um, outstretched to them to you um, but when it goes blurry 
for you to stop and then to move it back. The idea would be for you to eventually be able to see the ball as close as it possibly can to eventually touch your nose. So you're kind of using your eyes at the same point to try and focus. Um, don't, it doesn't have to be a ball. It could be, it could be a pen. Um, it could be anything like that. And then because we're, we're in, the, in, the, in a dynamic environment, move it around. You're kind, of, you're kind of tracking it along, but making sure you're just using your eyes and not your head. You're, you're just using your eyes to, to kind of track the, track the pen. They're just two simple exercises that, that, can be, that can be done. A variety of other things that can be done, but they're, they're, they're just two simple exercises that easily set up. You need minimal equipment. Um, and they can be incorporated when you're doing squats, when you're doing lunges, um, when you're doing all kinds of things. So it's not something that is so out there that people shouldn't be doing it. I mean, they're just three basic things that you could that you could incorporate. Um, the w- weird thing about the, the binocular vision, though, is the, re- the way I started to get onto it, and it was a really, really random thing. It was about six months into my, into my PhD, and all of a sudden I started to notice that when I was reverse parking, my parking was all of a sudden a bit skew with. And I'm like, I've never done this before. Why am I all of a sudden starting to park, park really, really skew with? Um, and then it turned out that I was overcompensating for my right, for my right eye. So yeah, that's, that's why it was. So that's, that's crazy. a bit, bit random. Lee, I think we can sit here and talk to you all day, but um, I think we'll stop here. There's a couple things I think we should definitely pick up in 18 months when the PhD is finished. And once you, once you've had a little bit more, the things I've got in my head is color, like color of shirts. Does that matter? Um, the interesting thing that you mentioned about point of mass and chest, because offside, you can be your, your shoulder can be on side and your arm can be offside. Is there, is the law wrong? Is there, is it humanly possible to actually completely get B correct in offside or not? Loads of things that we can discuss. Um, We'll save them for for um, for next year when, when that when that PhD is is over. Um, thank you so much for uh, being um, for coming on the podcast and sharing your research. If you are um, looking for more officials in the future, do let us know and we'll 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 mention it on the show and we'll tweet it out um, so that we can get some some other officials there and hopefully fingers crossed you get an elite official or two to, to come on as well, because that, that would be fascinating. Um, Lee, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And um, for, for those who are listening, I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, we'll see you next week.